Hi again. This is kind of the second part of um, a small webinar series with John Wettenhall from Atlassian. Hi, John, again. Hi again. Great to be, uh, great to be here at Vspot. Um, we just had another video about the Atlassian Summit um, and John's view on it. Um, John is the strategy and operations manager for Confluence and HipChat, right? Uh, no, just for Confluence. Just for Confluence. Just for okay. Confluence. Oh, okay. I I had these mean HipChat questions in stock, so uh, let's see. Maybe I'll. I'll you can ask. I just I, I'll bombard him answer. nevertheless. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's start with Confluence. Um, the last video ended with an awesome pitch of what Confluence is. So we're not going to repeat that. Um, let's um, say it's one of the leading, or it is probably the leading enterprise wiki in the world. And Atlassian doesn't like that term. Can you explain why? Why don't you want to be an enterprise wiki anymore? That's a good question. Wiki, there are many terms out there. Um, that I think have lots of connotations that come with that. I think when people think wiki, they think Wikipedia, which I think Wikipedia is an awesome resource. It's an awesome tool. And I think it helps people understand the concept of confluence. But we know that confluence is a lot more than a wiki. Um, I think people think of wikis as a place just to store information. But really, we see confluence as a place where people get work done and collaborate with their teams. Mm -hmm. So. Confluence, um, you know, one of our top use cases for Confluence among customers is project collaboration. Mm -hmm. So they start projects in Confluence, everything from uh, the planning to actually doing all the content work around it. It becomes the central hub for their entire project. They might be tracking um, you know, individual pieces of work in Jira. They might be um, storing code in Bitbucket. Um, they might be doing design work in in uh, Sketch and having those files in InVision. Um, they might be doing all those things, but really where the whole team comes together is in Confluence. And I think that that's just so much more than a wiki. Um, it, and I think another, another thing we see is that um, I think wikis are traditionally associated with more technical teams. And we really see people of all uh, different different trainings using Confluence. So you know, everybody so you could say it is a wiki, but it's a marketing tactic. Um, you could you could use it. Uh, yeah, you could, you could say it's a wiki, but I think it's it's more than a wiki. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's a long like, answer to that simple question, no, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question. It's a, it's a very good starter um, uh, of this um, uh, video. Um, I tend to explain people that Confluence is the cure for email and documents. Like there's those two diseases mm -hmm. that are like very prevalent, especially in those very big companies that we deal with when we try to introduce conference as an internet with this internet thing. Sure. Um, we see people sending heaps of emails, and every second email has an, a word file attached. And uh, like only if you're watching your own inbox. And you see an internal email from any of your coworkers with an, a word file attached, then you probably are due for this conference pure. And um, what I see in conference is that a lot of time that people spend in isolated files and sending back and forth emails with all the complexity of different versions, no one knows what's the current status, and things are not in sync. It's all kind of solved by this single point of truth central repository where even I can store my word files, right? I can still like keep, keep on creating these word files mm -hmm. for whatever reasons. For example, in Germany, lawyers still need these documents because they need to be printed and they need to be handed in as paper um, mainly. So um, even if you're depending on files, conference is still a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is it can get you rid of this time that people spend in email, and um, it can get, get you rid of these isolated documents. Yep. Um, 
Can you tell us a little bit about how Atlassian uses Confluence internally? Like um, your daily things? Like what do people do with it? Um, the easy answer to that question is that people do everything with Confluence. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a team in Atlassian that doesn't use Confluence every single day. And that's from obviously software development teams, RIT teams, to the HR team, the legal team, um, security team, our building, like our workplace experience team, which organizes everything. In they only do physical or mainly physical stuff. Right? Yeah, and they do all kinds of things in, in Confluence. Um, I mean, it's everything from people organizing projects, like I mentioned earlier. To we have, um, we put a bunch of data in there that we you know and we report do data reporting within Confluence. Um, so you pull things out of databases and streams, yep, and then yep. you and put them in chart them. Yeah, put them into Confluence so that we have ready, ready access to that data. Um, How about accessibility? Do, do people do you work with rights a lot? Is a lot of things locked down? Or is it mainly everything's open apart from a couple of pages? Um, we, I mean, one of our company values is open company, no bullshit. So I think in general, we try to be as open as possible. Um, we have tremendous access to all kinds of company information. I think people don't lock things down. You can see that in the way the product's built, you know, um, that we definitely. Um, optimize for people keeping things open. It's it's like a key differentiator. If you create something in SharePoint, for example, or in Google Docs, the thing is going to be locked down by default. Like yeah. you will be the only one being able to see that. If you do the same thing in Confluence, everyone who has access to the space will see the page. Sure. So it's default defaulted to be open, right? Yeah. Sure. And I mean, I think. Is it I, difficult for I, new employees to to get this like, oh, I'm going to share everything? Yeah, although it's a draft. I think I think people are often nervous about, oh, I don't want to publish this page because what if someone sees it or whatever? It's not breaking you. But I think that pretty soon people just get used to. It. They create a page, and you realize that people are busy. Like people have things to do. They're not out there looking for. Some page. What you did John Wettenhall do in terms of failures? Yeah, it's like no one's, him down. no one's out there looking for some page and trying to like poke holes in your thing. Certainly, there's times where a page uh, on some controversial topic gets published and it's open, and the person's not ready for feedback, and people find it, and then they get a bunch of feedback that maybe they weren't uh, expecting. Um, but that can be a good thing too. Because um, yeah. you you see how important this is to people, um, and and you adjust accordingly. But I think we, we to answer your question in general, we keep everything open. But certainly, we make use of permissions um, to discuss private topics, or even just um, you know maybe I do a lot of things with the Confluence leadership team, and so there's a lot of times where myself and our head of Confluence and our head of engineering have to discuss something, and we kind of keep that between the three of us. And then we expand it out to a wider group, and then maybe to the whole team, mm -hmm. um, just in different iterations. Um, so yeah, we definitely make, make use of permissions. If you say, at Atlassian, everything is down with Confluence, that sounds remote for a lot of our customers. Because sure. they have like thousands of employees. And those people, they are not even up to a level where they would themselves say, I'm using my digital tools at my hand today. So they they didn't adopt them yet. So if they try to introduce a new concept, this open concept that, and with all the political constraints that they have and the organizational flaws that Atlassian in, in most cases probably doesn't have, um, it is very difficult to transition from this isolated, siloed, non-public state into that everyone's working in public together as a team. Mm -hmm. Is there some magic sauce that you can share? How do I transition from one to the other? 
is there something that you try, for example, Elastin released these team playbooks where you try to share some of the things that you learn. Yep. Um, what can you give people in terms of tips? Okay. What, what could they try out? Well, um, I'm going to make a, do a little bit of self-promotion here, but I gave a talk at the most recent European summit in Barcelona, which was last week, um, on how to improve Confluence adoption. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're just adopting Confluence in your company and you want to figure out how to make it spread. Um, and I gave some tips. Um, I think the one that I would probably focus on right now and I think might be particularly relevant for a place where people aren't necessarily on their computers all day um, is to think about how your company makes announcements. So I think what we see is a lot of companies Someone has something they need to share, they write an email, and they send it to the whole company, or they send it to some email distribution list. Now, what Confluence offers is um, an internal blog. So within every Confluence space, there's a blog. And you can write a blog post, you can put in images, you can put in videos, you know, whatever content you need to really help get your point across. And um, I think that for people that maybe aren't on their computer all day, a good way to get introduced to this style of openness and transparency is for other people to be sharing blog posts, mm -hmm. sharing in information internally. So then they don't have to rely on someone thinking to send them an email. They just published it in a place that's open for anyone to see. And um, like I know a lot of stuff you guys do with Lynchpin is how to surface that. Information. Yeah, we, we actually do exactly that. There's a, a whole, a uh, plugin, Enterprise News Bundle, we call that, who helps customers do that in a more internet 1.0 way with like big pictures and like a new style um, layout for for those blog posts. But basically, people st still create blog posts. They get mm -hmm. some basic features on workflows where you can say this should only be published Monday and sure. it should only be live for two weeks for whatever reasons. I, actually, I think this is not uh, a useless um, thing, but, but those big companies have um, even kind of um, work, workers' unions are very strong in Germany. Mm -hmm. And then they're, um, like they have an agreement with the workers' union, for example, that if they post a job offering, they'll take it off after two weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, for whatever reason, <laughs> but it's very common to have that. So they needed a uh, um, a way to define when something is and when it goes offline. Yeah. And then for, if you do standards and norms like ISO, FDA, HIPAA, um, or in Germany, EN or DEN, -D um, then uh, you have to document a lot of things to, to meet these standards. And um, those media information will can be attached to, to the blog post. But basically, it's the same, uh, st the same contract. And also, Confluence does a little to promote those blog posts, right? It sends out emails, I think. Yep. And, um, yeah, yeah. so I think um, like you can be watching a blog. So let's say you're in the um, corporate news. Yeah, the corporate space, news uh, space, and you watch that blog. So you'll get a notification via email every time a new post is sent out, which means it's easy to make sure you go and read that. Um, you can also, you know, if, you're, if your company is smaller, it doesn't have a lot of blog posts, you can actually watch all blog posts. You can get notifications every time a new blog post is written anywhere in confidence, which uh, I wouldn't recommend doing if you have a lot of blog posts, you get a lot but of- But you can, you can still turn it, it off be, when yeah, it could uh, be after it takes off. It could be a good way to find out, what, what's, being out what's being written out there. Um, and then you can cut it down to which blogs you're interested in. There's actually have been projects uh, where we've consulted and implemented stuff for our customers who wanted to get rid of internal newsletters. So people in a 55,000 um, employee company started to send a lot of newsletters internally because they wanted to get attention on what their department or their product uh, suite was doing. So they started sending out newsletters to their own employees. And those blogs 
were a very good way to tame that down and tell people, look, we put the blog post there, and we'll help you distribute it that yeah. and make this available, personalized um, within a uh, conference. Still, I do think that we both, and that's why you're giving a talk on this, adoption is a difficult topic, right? It's sure. not a, there's no not that secret sauce that you can just pour over people's head, and then yeah. they'll just switch from creating right. emails and documents and creating uh, conference pages. How long do you think is the time to understand the software. We've been talking about simply powerful, making the UX even better in the surface. But how long do you think do I need to stay in cold water until I can swim in confluence easily? How long is that? It's really difficult to answer that question because I think it depends on the person and it depends on the confluence instance that they're joining. So like in my own experience, I had very limited exposure to Confluence before I joined Atlassian. Mm -hmm. um, but I came in Atlassian, I was using it every day from day one, um, and I had lots of examples. Did you get a training? No. No training? No. Atlassian doesn't give training to employees. Uh, I Confluence. think we had like a, yeah, we had like a little thing that was like, this is what Confluence does, but it was just done by uh, someone from the Confluence team, it was pretty short. Um, but yeah, so I guess my point is I learned it very quickly because I, I needed to, but also because I had lots of examples to work from. So mm -hmm. I, I think, and this is what I, what I say in my talk, is that I think confidence is best learned by observation and by doing, um, mm -hmm. like everything, like everything. But I think in particular, you see a beautiful confidence page, you can click edit, and you can see, see how someone put that page good. together. If you go into Confluence and there's nothing there and you're starting from scratch, that's when it can feel like, oh, well, what do I do? What is this for? And that's a problem that we're, we're working on solving. And um, we, like, if you start a new cloud instance today, you get all this demo content. And you can see like, how a project space might be set up versus a knowledge base and see some of the sample types of pages. And then you can kind of go in and, yeah. and copy um, my, I have, there's a, there's a famous quote from, um, I think it's originally a Picasso quote, but Steve Jobs apparently liked this quote in, in the movie Pirates of Silicon Valley, which is a classic uh, kind of Silicon Valley story of, of Apple. But Steve Jobs is uh, at Xerox. Xerox actually came up with the mouse. Mm -hmm. right, this thing. So, and, and uh, and Steve Jobs says, good artists copy, great artists steal. Because mm -hmm. Apple basically stole the idea from the mouse from Xerox. But I think that that is, well, maybe not the most positive sentiment. I think that's kind of the, like something I think applies to Confluence, which is you don't need to reinvent creating things. You can look at what other people have done. So I think, is it gonna, are you going to get Confluence in an hour? It depends. If you use similar things, if you're um, if you have a lot of stuff to work from, probably probably not. But you might you might figure out how to create pages really well, and then you might understand how Confluence is organized and how you want to organize your pages later on. Um, but I think the the key thing is just to to figure out what you want to try to accomplish accomplish with Confluence, and then try and tailor your learning to that. Yeah. I, um, I would want to share a story about a um, local club um, where I wanted to introduce Confluence. So I gave them a presentation. They were thrilled. Like they have no tools. It's a um, uh, um, um, not for commercial, it's like a sports club. And so they were very thrilled. And um, then I gave them an account, and they could use it. Nothing happened. Talked to a guy probably one or two months later. Said, yeah, I was still very up to doing that. We should share this more. So they invited more people. Then in the first time, they had probably eight out of 800 club members was there. Second time, it was 25 people. Gave very, very much the same presentation, showed them around, and it was uh, in the tool and like no slides really in, in conference. And then 25 people were very thrilled. 
two months later, nothing happened. And I was asking myself, like, I'm selling this. Like, confidence is a very um, important tool for us. And how can it be that I introduce that to people and then they don't use it afterwards? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very much to what you said, like, you do have to have someone who's putting in activity first so that people can see something. And I think it is even more than demo content. You have to have something that is kind of relevant for their use case, and that is also relevant for, um, for their adoption. So, right. uh, and then what we did in the next steps is we sat down with a much smaller subset, like three people, mm -hmm. and created pages. Like, one was very, very simple. It was just like a list of names, email addresses, and phone numbers of the most important people in this club. Very simple page, right? Just the table. And um, uh, the next was um, a form that you could fill out to become a club member. So people could go there, download it, and send it up by their email. Yeah. And then there were probably 10 other pages of uh, that type of, type of style. And that kicked it off. Like it was probably an hour of work with three people, really creating content. And then people started to understand the concept. Ah, there's someone missing. There's an, a, a contact person that they missed in this table. So I'm going to create a new column and mm -hmm. add this. Um, there could be pictures of these people. So I'm going to put a picture. Sure. Um, there could be, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever they, they but uh, it's still not, I would, wouldn't say it, it flies, but I do see probably five or 10 edits per week now. And there were like six months of nothingness. Um, the whole time. And this is something that people, in my understanding, it's also probably a product obstacle that you have is how do you instill this initial activity in one guy or one team to reach or to go the extra mile, create this relevant content, mm -hmm. and make this uh, an outlet of useful information? And it's, it's not easy, in my opinion, because uh, if everyone waits, nothing's going to happen anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I think if, if you're keen on it and you see some value in confluence, like, start using it with your team. Start creating some pages. Organize, organize your next project in confluence. And then I think if, you, if it starts to take off in your team and you want to spread it to the rest of your organization, um, my advice, which is in my in that talk I gave um, is to get another team on board which has information the whole company wants and needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and usually, I think that the team that that is is your human resources team, your people team, as we call it at Atlassian. And those are things like vacation policies, benefits and perks, um, things like you know where where to find things in the office. Um, and I actually, I actually give the example of, of you guys putting your lunch menus in mm -hmm. Confluence because it's like that's something that people want every day. And if you're sending out an email for that, it's easy to just send out an email and say, "Hey, lunch menus are on this page," and you do that for yeah. you do that for a week, and all of a sudden, people are skipping the email and then they're just checking the page, they're watching the page or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you can. You know, you can kind of start small and then find a few things that uh, will take it to the next level, and um, and then it'll grow organically from there. What's the biggest competitor that you see out there? Like, I'm not using Confluence. What should I be using then? I think the um, the biggest competitor to Confluence is um, a resistance to wanting to change the way you work. So I think it's kind of to what you mentioned earlier around people working in documents and email. Um, there are other tools out there that people use. I don't think there's any tool that really provides the same experience as Confluence. I think there's other tools out there that maybe do some things better. Um, you know, maybe they have a a better name. Like maybe they have a better editor, or maybe they do um, sharing really well. Mm -hmm. But they don't put it all together. Give me an example of someone doing something better. 
Um, I mean, I think like an example, we talk like Google Docs is a great example. Mm -hmm. Google Docs is it's super easy to open up and start creating a page, and it's really easy to share that page with people. I even think, outsiders, right? yeah, even outsiders. Um, but but still, to me, like, I think Google Docs is like. I can never find anything in Google Docs. Oh, I think it's, it's ridiculous. I think it's, the, it's, there's, it's, no organiz, there's no organization. Um, and I think Google Docs, they've basically taken Microsoft Word and put it online. But that, that's that's their goal, like, in my opinion. Like, no, totally. Google, they're, they're recreating. What Google did, did is they just tear Microsoft apart. They just created an awesomely rich copy of Word, and then they, they improved it. So that, uh, in my opinion, everyone who's using uh, Word today, even Office 365, comes falls short of what Google uh, Docs uh, provides. At the same time, I fully agree. I would also name Google Docs or Office 365 as kind of competitors, because this is where you go on creating these documents. Mm -hmm. But there's also, those are silos. Everyone knows that this is an isolated file. When have you put the last time a link to something in a Word file that's like very rare. Yeah. And if so, it is a link to a website, right? It's not a link to another document, because this kind of doesn't work. Yeah. And um, what you do in Confluence a lot is you say, oh, this page has grown way too big. Let's tear it apart and have like five different outlets. Yeah. And then have links to uh, for people to see that. And like, you can build big webs of pages, and at the same time have every single element be very concise and focused. Yeah. And that's impossible with uh, Google Docs. And and search is <laughs> ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. I never find so as. The first thing, when I try to find a table, for example, Confluence isn't that strong in tables, right? Like, if you want to do a lot of calculations, pivot sure. tables, and all sure. this, there's a couple of add-ons that you could use, but like well, the, the basic product doesn't, doesn't offer that too well. And um, the first thing I'm asking our people is, what's the exact name? Like, don't give me an S too much. Don't give me the, the rough. Yeah. Give me the exact name so that I can find the file. Yeah, and it's it's uh, like yeah. sometimes you yeah. feel. I, mean, I, I think that the thing is with with those tools is I think they've taken problems that people have had for fifteen or twenty years um, in the enterprise where you're creating a word document, it's in some shared drive. Um, theoretically, you might be able to find it if you knew that file existed and you knew like kind of where it was, or maybe you could kind of click around and maybe find it. And I think that. Um, you know, just as, as Google Docs has recreated Microsoft Word in the cloud, I think they've just duplicated a lot of those problems. Yeah. Um, I think that like a lot of people talk about Dropbox and they're like, oh, well, I can share all my files, um, you know, and store them on the cloud, and people can have access to shared folders and things like that. And again, I think it's it's the same thing. It's just uh, it's just in the cloud, and it feels new, um, and it feels different. But I think really what Confluence has done has it's changed the model, and um, I think at, at Atlassian we see it, it really works, and we've seen a lot of our customers but when they when they get it, when people really like think about things in this different way, you just are able to work a lot faster and find information that you need. I mean, a great example is preparing for this uh, webinar with you. Um, like I was able to go dig up a bunch of hip chat information that no one ever shared with me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know it existed, but I was able to because I it, it's in Confluence and I know where it might be. Mm -hmm. I was able to go in and find the information myself, and it's all open and it's there for me to use. And it's and now I'm you know I'm more informed because I could find that myself. Um, I would never pose any hip check questions. Yeah, and I would ne never be able to do that, do that um, in in some of these other tools. Yeah, I I like the um, the image that you draw um, about Google Docs is a new hammer for the Microsoft Word hammer. Like it's yeah. better, it's faster, it's cloud, it's modern, it's on my mobile app, all cool. Yeah, but it's still like a hammer. 
yeah. while uh, confluence is a different concept. And it is true that people have to make up their mind. Do you want to be open? Do you want to share? Do you want to have this single point of truth? Do you trust your people to make informed decisions? Or is it more that you say, oh, by the way, I have a, some of our customers say, we have a need to know culture. Mm -hmm. That means everyone gets as much information as he needs to know. So yeah. you have only very limited access to information as an employee. Yeah. And you cannot inform yourself about decisions. You're yeah. just more uh, someone who's doing the work that someone else tells them to do. And if you have that type of culture and you want to maintain it and you think you're going to survive the next years with that culture, probably conference is not the right tool because you still have these rights and you could configure it in a way that it is very restricted. And we see customers do that. So it's possible. But still, those other products, they are kind of built for that. Like everything's isolated, every, everything's locked down. So um, if that is the culture you want to breed, Probably not that modern, probably not that um, the right tactic to survive as a company in the next years. But uh, I would say confluence is not another hammer. It's, it's a different concept. It's a different tool. Yeah. It's a magic wand. Yeah, the magic wand. Uh, OK, so three questions about HipChat. Is it, is it going to die because the others are so much faster in investing heavily, like Microsoft comes out with Microsoft Teams? Google comes up with um, Google Hangouts chat. Um, Slack is there, reigning the field. Um, then we have Facebook Messenger, we have WhatsApp, we have Telegram. Like group chat is a very, very busy place. And the other players, at last is, I don't know, an eight billion company. And um, like Microsoft and Google and Facebook, they're like giants. They are like so much bigger. They have so many more uh, employees working on these problems. Do you have a chance, like over the next ten years, as at last time, to to have anything of significance in group chat? Um, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think HipChat uh, is a great product as it is today. Um, I think it's. It's not without its faults, um, and we we have an awesome team that's working super hard on that. I think sometimes it's not always obvious to the public what what it is we're doing, but I think in the next the next year you'll you'll really see a lot of improvement from HipChat. Um, is there enough space for it in the market? I would say absolutely. I mean, the new new messaging tools are being launched all the time. And I think it just indicates that like there's tremendous demand for group messaging, um, and I think uh, it's something HipChat. I feel like really paved the way for kind of this next version of uh, workplace messaging. Um, I mean, HipChat was around well before before Slack and um, some of these other tools, and um, we came up with a lot a lot of those features. Um, and now I think we, we have to do some work to, to really keep up. But absolutely, I think it's an important part of our, our product offering. And I think it will continue to be for years to come. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely this behind the server implementation. No one actually can do that, right? Lesson is the only one to offer that. There is some open source stuff that you could install, like MetaMost or uh, Rocket Chat. Have I heard of those two? Nope. OK, so th those are obviously uh, group chat solutions um, that are open source. Still, they don't have a decent app. And they, uh, yeah. they have some other um, significant problems um, that, that I see, at least. Um, uh, so behind the firewall is a very strong thing. Integration with other glassing tools is definitely something that you will maintain forever, I think. And continue, it's, yeah, um, continue to improve. We just, uh, in the last few months, we just uh, launched new Confluence and Jira integrations with HipChat, and also um, added a new Bitbucket one as well. But, but yeah, those will continue to get stronger. Um, 
I mean, our view is always like we're going to integrate with lots of tools, but um, like our integrations between our own products should be the best. So, do you ever get um, messages from coworkers through other channels? Like, do, do, does anyone send you a WhatsApp message or a Facebook Messenger message anytime? Uh, not for work reasons, mostly yeah. like for social reasons. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but no, I mean we're 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 solidly on the chat and uh, yeah. I think I do think you, it's it's working well. Do you envision that people use multiple messengers in the workplace tomorrow, or is it a one solution thing? As I only have one phone, right? So yeah, I mean one phone number that you can reach me at. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, everyone uses email still, and. You probably have a group apart from the fifteen-year-old people, right? Yeah, and they, they, yeah, they they don't. They do everything on Snapchat, but uh, uh, any of a group chat tool, and then you know, in a way, like you're getting notifications in Confluence and Jira and other tools you use. So, like, those are kind of messaging. Um, what I think will be interesting, and I don't know the answer to this, but I think it'll be interesting to see how how does chat and how does messaging evolve to be more alongside the tools we're spending our days in. So like chat is separate to components right now, for example. But I see a future in which it becomes maybe more embedded in the mm -hmm. components experience. Yeah. You I think a great example is real time editing. You and a bunch of people are working on a page together. Some of you in the same place, some of you're not in the same place. You, you can to just it. click to chat and then it pops up right through the window. Um, which is functionality that other other products have today. Um, you know, I think we've been cautious about putting chat into Confluence or into Jira because if you're in Confluence, you want to be focused probably on what you're reading or what you're creating. And if you're getting pings in your window, like that's distracting. Yeah. Um, we obviously want people to be connected, but we also want people to get stuff Focus done and be, be able to be productive and. And so something that we think a lot about is not just like, OK, how can we get you the most notifications, the most messages the quickest, but just um, what do you actually need to get work done? So I think that's something that I don't think people have quite solved. I think everyone thought, oh, man, these group messaging uh, tools have, have killed email. But have they killed email, or have they just moved it? And now it's almost worse because instead of you're getting emails all day, you're getting you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can respond to them when you want. You're getting messages all day, but they're actually coming in when you're trying to do other work. So I think that's something that is a problem that people will still need to solve. Yeah. Um, what I like a lot in, in your or Lassen's vision for uh, HipChat is that it is kind of like an operational system for businesses mm -hmm. so that tasks and content and things that we're working on is flowing into certain rooms. Yep. And then um, if there's an incident or a, uh, something that um, is a risk for me as a company, I can I can use this room as a commander central yep. and um, have the sidebars be populated with uh, relevant conference pages, with Jira issues, with yep. um, status uh, information from status page, and so on. That's something that I think only Elastic can offer in HipChat, and something that I'm very excited about. Yeah. And in my personal opinion, there is room for more than one messenger yeah. um, in a company. And I can still see that uh, HipChat has a good chance to be the one messenger that companies use, um, especially in Germany, as we're kind of old style with all this privacy and behind the firewall stuff. It's the solution that I would want to pitch. John, thank you so much for sharing all this adoption knowledge. Uh, what Summit. was the title of your talk at Summit? Um, I think it's Tips for Confluence Adoption. But it's about, comp it's about okay. Confluence Adoption. John Wettenhall at Lesson Summit Barcelona. Yeah, uh, um, and it'll be the only one yeah. about Confluence Adoption. So you can go in there and find it. And it's, uh, it's short. It's like 14 or 15 minutes. So. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and it's meant to be um, super hands-on, so I actually get into like some specific. And there's even a CBIT Media screenshot in it. There is. So, um, John, thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. Um, taking the time, and if you have any questions, um, 
You can reach out to John J. Wettenhall on Twitter, for example. Shen he also has an email address. You can reach out to us, and um, we may be inclined to, to ask him. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.